All right, chapter four, in which Phileas Fogg astounds Passapartout, his servant. Having won twenty guineas at whist and taken leave of his friends, Phileas Fogg, at twenty-five minutes past seven, left the Reform Club. Passapartout, who had conscientiously studied the program of his duties, was more than surprised to see his master guilty of the inexactness of appearing at this unaccustomed hour, for according to rule he was not due in Seville Row until precisely midnight. Mr. Fogg repaired to his bedroom and called out, Passapart out! Passapart out did not reply. It could not be he who was called. It was not the right hour. Passapart out! replied Mr. Fogg without raising his voice. Passapart out made his appearance. I've called you twice, observed his master. But it is not midnight, responded the other, showing his watch. I know it. I don't blame you. We start for Dover and Calais in ten minutes. A puzzled grin overspread Passapart out's round face. Clearly he had not comprehended his master. Monsieur, is going to leave home? Yes, returned Phileas Fogg. We are going round the world. Passapart out opened wide his eyes, raised his eyebrows, held up his hands, and seemed about to collapse. So overcome was he with stupefied astonishment. Round the world, he murmured. In eighty days, responded Mr. Fogg, so we haven't a moment to lose. But the trunks, gasped Passapart out, unconsciously swaying his head from right to left. We'll have no trunks, only a carpet bag, with two shirts and three pairs of stockings for me, and the same for you. We'll buy our clothes on the way, bring down my Macintosh and traveling cloak and some stout shoes, though we shall do little walking. Make, ha make haste. Passapart out tried to reply, but could not. He went out, mounted to his own room, fell into a chair and muttered, That's good, that is, and I who wanted to remain quiet. He mechanically set about making the preparations for departure. Around the world in eighty days, was his master a fool? No. Was this a joke, then? They were going to Dover. Good. To Calais? Hmm. Good again. After all, Passapart out, who had been away from France five years, would not be sorry to set foot on his native soil again. Perhaps they would go as far as Paris, and it would do his eyes good to see Paris once more. But surely a gentleman so chary of his steps would stop there. No doubt. But then it was nonetheless true that he was going away, this so domestic person hitherto. By eight o'clock, Passapart out had packed a modest carpet bag containing the wardrobes of his master and himself. Then, still troubled in mind, he carefully shut the door of his room and descended to Mr. Fogg. Mr. Fogg was quite ready. Under his arm might have been observed a red-bound copy of Bradshaw's Continental Railway Steam Transit and General Guide, with its timetables showing the arrival and departure of steamers and railways. He took the carpet bag, opened it, and slipped it into a goodly roll of and slipped into it a goodly roll of Bank of English notes, which would pass wherever he might go. I think that's money. You have forgotten nothing? asked he. Nothing, monsieur. My Mackintosh and cloak? Here they are. Good. Take this carpet bag, handing it to pass part out. Take good care of it, for there are twenty thousand pounds in it. Pass a part out nearly dropped the bag, as if the twenty thousand pounds were in gold, and weighed him down. Master and man then descended the street door. Then descended. The street door was double locked, and at the end of Seville Row they took a cab and drove rapidly to Charing Cross. The cab stopped before the railway station at twenty minutes past eight. Pass part out jumped off the box and followed his master, who, after paying the cabman, was about to enter the station when a poor beggar woman with a child in her arms, her naked feet smeared with mud, her head covered with a wretched bonnet from which hung a tattered feather, and her shoulders shrouded in a ragged shawl, approached and mournfully asked for alms. Mr. Fogg took out the twenty guineas he had just won at whist and handed them to the beggar, saying, Here, my good woman, I'm glad that I met you, and passed on. Pass apart out had a moist sensation about his eyes. His master's actions touched his susceptible heart. Two first-class tickets for Paris having been speedily purchased, Mr. Fogg was crossing the station to the train when he perceived his five friends of the reform. Well, gentlemen, said he, I am off, you see, and if you examine my passport when I get back, you will be able to judge whether I have accomplished the journey agreed upon. Oh, that would be quite unnecessary, Mr. Fogg, said Ralph politely. We will trust your word as a gentleman of honor. 
You do not forget when you are due in London again, asked Stuart. <clears throat> in 80 days, on Saturday, the 21st of December, 1872, at a quarter before 9 p.m., goodbye, gentlemen. Phileas Fogg and his servant seated themselves in a first-class carriage at 20 minutes before 9. Five minutes later, the whistle screamed and the train slowly glided out of the station. The night was dark and a fine steady rain was falling. Phileas Fogg, snugly ensconced in his corner, did not open his lips. Passapart out, not yet recovered from his stupefaction, clung mechanically to the carpet bag with its enormous treasure. Just as the train was whirling through Sydneyham, Passapart out suddenly uttered a cry of despair. What's what's the matter? asked Mr. Fogg. Alas, in my hurry, I, for, uh, I forgot. What? To turn off the gas in my room. Very well, young man, returned Fogg coolly. It will burn at your expense. That's chapter four.